this uh, med plus workshop i am rinal biswas i am one of the main developers at dtc in NCAR. so today we have uh, some wonderful speakers we have uh, several feature based talks and few others so without further delay i will ask harvey to start your presentation you have 15 minutes i will give you a two minute warning and take it away okay thank you and good morning and good evening to all of you so today i'm presenting application of mode for verifying tmax during record heat waves over india this is uh, 2020 mam so uh, here are some outlines objectives heat waves over india or heat wave criteria over india climatology of temperature and frequencies and some meteorology the objective is diagnostic evolutions and the heat wave movement guidance so objectives as a part of a new generation verification team developed at the uk met office so model evolution tool package is now uh, being uh, used for seamless verification for operational forecast uh, that is global and regional at ncmrwf for the object based uh, verification maximum temperature forecast first time in india the mode module is used to track the record heat waves over india so uh, coming to the heat wave uh, how it's defined here so it's uh, the abnormally high temperatures during the spring and summer seasons that is march to july over uh, northwestern parts of india heat waves typically occur between march to may over the indian landmass they can extend uh, over uh, june and july also so official criteria for heat wave uh, in india is uh, like uh, maximum temperature should be at least 40 degrees celsius for plains 37 degrees celsius for for <coughs> coastal regions and uh, 30 degrees celsius for hilly regions so uh, based on the departure from the normal heat wave uh, can be defined as the departure from normal is 4.5 degrees celsius to 6.5 degrees celsius and severe heat wave can be defined uh, the departure from normal is greater than 6.4 degrees celsius and based on the actual temperatures heat wave uh, defined as the maximum temperature is uh, greater than 45 greater than or equal to 45 degrees celsius and severe heat wave 47 degrees celsius and more warm night and uh, uh, other things for the coastal regions also like uh, 37 degrees Celsius for departure which is uh, above normal uh, 4.5 degrees Celsius. So this uh, heat wave can be defined if uh, at least two stations within the max subdivision should report any of the above conditions for two consecutive days. Then the heat wave is declared on the second day of uh, the year. Now, now these are the climate losses and frequencies uh, from uh, for India. So India Meteorological Department uh, has given some data and that is uh, from March to May uh, 1981 to uh, 2010. So frequencies uh, here we can see, uh, this is the uh, mean temperature uh, 1981 to 2010. And uh, we can see here the uh, greater than 30 degrees, uh, 38 degrees Celsius and 48, uh, 40 degrees Celsius temperatures are in the central and south central India. And we can uh, have the uh, frequencies here uh, for greater than 40 degrees Celsius. So here it is in the range of uh, 40 to 50 number of days out of uh, 92. So uh, this is the, uh, we can say average per uh, season. So that is March to May. And uh, uh, greater than 45 degrees Celsius uh, uh, frequencies are uh, 0 to 5, or we can say 1 to 5 in the range. And uh, this is uh, stretching from northwest India to, to southeast India. <clears throat> and uh, greater than 47 degrees Celsius also is uh, like uh, north central India and some patch in the uh, western parts of uh, India. And it is uh, frequency also like uh, 5, uh, up to 5 uh, the number of days. And uh, for the current scenario, we can have the uh, heat with uh, frequencies. Uh, here we can uh, have the means uh, record heat waves. Also, temperature is exceeding 40 degrees Celsius in most of the places of the Indian continent. And uh, it is uh, 
its frequency also we can here see that the greater than uh, 70 number of days out of 92 it is giving the northwest india and some central india also and uh, 45 degree celsius uh, temperature frequency is also increased uh, it's up to uh, number of uh, 5 or <clears throat> 15 in uh, northwest india and uh, uh, 125 uh, within central india and uh, here uh, one thing is uh, can be noticed here the so northwest india is uh, increasing trends uh, even the himalayan region also uh, 47 degrees celsius temperature frequency is increased now uh, coming to the point uh, like uh, so data i am used for the india meteorological departments and uh, forecast data or uh, uh, unified model yeah so this one is uh, like I'm using the method for object based diagnostic evolution and it, it gives uh, like uh, one use cases uh, for the 13th May. So it is uh, very well uh, predicted or uh, forecasted. It's giving like uh, uh, 0 0.9661 uh, uh, median of maximum interest uh, for uh, more or less uh, same for the observation and forecast and forecast and observation also 0 0.9651. And uh, on 14th May, uh, this uh, object uh, is uh, like uh, greater than 41 degrees Celsius, 43 and 45. Model forecasted uh, heat wave event in the west compared to the uh, observations. So here, uh, uh, this is clearly the same. And uh, one event is uh, uh, 15th of May. Uh, 15th of May, uh, like uh, upper panel is showing uh, Max greater than 41 degrees Celsius, then 43 degrees Celsius, then 45 degrees Celsius. So, up to uh, first one is uh, uh, first column is from observation, and the uh, second, third, and fourth column is day one, day three, and day five forecast from the unified model that we see model here. And uh, uh, these objects uh, are uh, looking like uh, uh, very much uh, accurately forecasted by the model. And uh, in the <clears throat> higher temperatures, like 45 degrees Celsius, also some some uh, orientation is slightly different, but the uh, uh, event is forecasted for the region. Now, uh, coming to this heat wave movement guidance, uh, also I plotted uh, uh, this one uh, during uh, 17th of uh, 7th of uh, May to 17th May. Here is the central distance uh, I plotted for the forecast and the observations. There the uh, objects is uh, make some uh, central distance for the observation. Obje like uh, for initial days, uh, I can say uh, 7th, 8th or 9th of May, it is uh, giving the huge error in uh, central distance. Or here we can compute the like distance error and time, time error also from there. And uh, later also, uh, like the 16th and 17th of May, it is giving uh, some error. Now, uh, here we are doing some uh, like uh, statistics uh, area ratio. Area ratio for the entire season for 2022. So uh, temperature exceeding uh, 41 degrees Celsius and 43 and 45 is showing here. So uh, uh, area ratio is also uh, in the range of uh, like up to eight. Uh, 0 0.8 and uh, uh, it is slightly decreased in the 45 degrees Celsius and total interest uh, also it is giving uh, close to one uh, in the 41 43 and 40, 45 it is slightly less uh, 0.9 uh, 0.9 995 worth around so uh, this uh, I'm coming to the end so the way forward actually we are implementing here the matplus tools so uh, and uh, other things and utilization of uh, mode and MTD for uh, weekly, monthly, and seasonal scales. And on uh, one more thing, uh, like uh, uh, matplotpy and uh, matcalpy to calculate and plot the certain matrices such as commonly used in this case, and MathViewer Math Viewer or MathExpress user interface can generate some uh, scorecard generation. So thank you. If any questions. Thank you, Harveer. Yeah, I think we have time for questions. You can raise your hand, put it in the chat, or you can unmute and you know speak up.
Okay, hearing none. Harveer, uh, are you interested in you know running any more time domain, uh, whether it's necessary for your work? Yeah, I'm interested actually. Uh, I used to uh, working on this mat uh, since uh, 2011. 11 to 15, actually, I was working. Then I moved to some other project. Last year onwards, uh, I made live uh, this mat uh, plus. Now it is a uh, drastic change in uh, mat version also. So it took me a, a little time to understand the things, the latest versions. And I'm going through it. And mat plus uh, mode, point step, grid step, reflex. Actually, yesterday I mentioned all those tools uh, which I used there. So uh, I'm, I, I, I have not included those slides today. So uh, yeah, I'm very much interested to include uh, his uh, working on this MTD and uh, other tools also. Okay. okay maybe we are a little bit ahead of time. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Hello, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding the the plot that you did uh, for tip maximum temperature uh, larger than forty one Celsius degrees. I think you showed yeah. in the map uh, from one day to seventy days. Did you look uh, on how? is the frequency of the number of days of heat waves in that region. For example, you have a heat wave of uh, 15 days, we have a more frequency of heat waves in that region, at least for Okay, okay. This, this frequency. My slide is, busy, is still busy then? No. No. Okay, uh, so your question is uh, uh, regarding this frequency of uh, like uh, greater than 41 degrees Celsius or uh, 45 or 43. Yeah, because you have more frequency of uh, heat waves with temperatures more than 40, 40 Celsius degrees. Yeah, yeah, I'm having uh, all those. Uh, actually, I exceeded up to 49 degrees Celsius in India. But actually, for mode, actually it is smoothing some uh, temperature, so it is little uh, down here. So mm -hmm. uh, it is not uh, for mode. Actually, it is not exceeding. Uh, object is not making after uh, forty-six degrees Celsius. Some objects formed uh, over forty-six degrees Celsius, but forty-seven, forty-eight, and forty-nine, uh, I couldn't find any objects because of the smoothing uh, of this. Uh, Convolution uh, smoothing or the convolution radius applied to the. I think here I have applied for the four uh, grid squares of this radius. So it is little down. down. So, for, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. And how do you configure the parameters of uh, mode? Um, okay. Mode uh, matrix. For mode, for mode matrix, for, te for temperatures, or running mode, or. Uh, uh, yeah, I didn't get your question actually. Yeah, th there are some uh, parameters to configuring mode. Okay. Like uh, centroids and, and other other parameters that should be configured. Yeah, yeah, I configured all those parameters. Like uh, uh, here, I have given the T max for uh, both observation and the forecast, and I have given some threshold values also there. So uh, those threshold values uh, I computed like uh, from uh, greater than 41 degrees Celsius to 49 degrees Celsius in the of 1 degree Celsius. And uh, uh, those uh, you are asking about uh, uh, temperature ranges. Uh, you get oh, sorry uh, the uh, uh, object uh, formation uh, whatever the input I have given like the matching and merging criteria, fuzzy logic engine, all those things. Right now, I have used the default one, those things, but uh, the total interest uh, I have been given threshold like uh, uh, 0 0.7, degree, uh, 0 0.7 or 70 percent of uh, those interest can be counted as the object. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. in the interest of time, we need to move forward. So, Christina, you, you're up next. So, she'll be talking on ob object 
best met plus verification from convection allowing to climate models? Christina. All right, thanks. Uh, are you able to see my PowerPoint? Yes. 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 Oh, we did. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Uh, so I will uh, go ahead and get uh, started then. As uh, he just said, I will be talking about object-based MET plus verification on uh, a couple of different cases, uh, different scales. So. Uh, starting off with a little bit of overview on why we would want to use objects. Uh, traditional verification focuses on our grid-to-grid -grid based metrics. And although they're simple to use, they have some problems, such as they ignore spatial coherence, they don't tell you the cause of a good or a poor score, and then also the uh, double penalty issues, where in my forecast and observation shown up here, I would get no credit for a forecast like this because there's no overlap in uh, spatially. So uh, the method for object-based diagnostic evaluation or mode was designed to uh, alleviate some of these issues, but it can be difficult to use. So the purpose of my talk here is to examine different ways to use object-based output. And I'll be talking specifically about three use cases. They are similar and that they all use mode for evaluation, but they differ in the spatial scale and the model used, the variables evaluated, and also what kind of post-processing is done on the mode output. So those three use cases are first a climate use case, looking at Indian monsoon precipitation, and then second, a convection allowing model use case, which examines hail size, and then the third one is another convection allowing model use case, which looks at brightness temperature. So I'm showing here the diagram to the right. Obviously, mode is one of the tools I'm going to be using, but also in this case, mode analysis. And then grid stat, grid stat uh, sneaks into one of the use cases as well. So these use cases are available uh, online as part of MET Plus but not all of the post-processing that I'm showing is part of MET+. Plus. So a little bit of setup. I'm going to assume at this point that most people here have seen mode and have a, a general idea of what it does. Uh, and here are some of the settings that I'm using for the different use cases. These aren't all of them, but uh, you'll notice that the convolution radius is the smallest for our Indian monsoon precipitation case as that model resolution is already the lowest, so it needs less smoothing. There's some aerial thresholds applied to the uh, monsoon precipitation and hail size, but no area threshold for the brightness temperature evaluation. And also the way in which they handle merging is different between the three use cases. Uh, I have links here to the use cases. There are some other settings that are set. So if you want to see the full ones available, um, then going to any of those links uh, would be the best way to do it. This talk is available uh, in the uh, external drive. All right, so with that, we'll go ahead and talk about the first use case, which is to evaluate the representation of the Indian monsoon precipitation using the community earth system model, total precipitation. If you're unfamiliar, this is a global coupled climate model, and it's roughly uh, 1.25 degrees in longitude and about 0.95 in latitude. There's some extra decimal points on that. The time period I'm going to show is June, July, August for 2014, so the whole summer season, most 24 hour lead time, although there is one slide that will show uh, an additional, that will have additional lead times uh, included in the summary. We'll be comparing this to global precipitation climatology project observations. And in this case, we'll be looking at seasonal statistics. So what tools can we use to summarize mode output rather than looking at you know, each day individually? And uh, one of those tools here is uh, an object frequency map. So these maps on the right show the frequency with which each grid point is part of an object over the time period. And the top is for the observation and the bottom is for the forecast. And so we can compare these. And when we do that, 
uh, what we notice here is that the uh, object frequency in our CESM model is bimodal in the north-south direction. And the bottom peak is too frequent. So it's producing too many objects or too much precipitation over the monsoon time period in comparison to what was seen in our observations. Also, this peak is shifted slightly further north than what we see in the observations. In Western India, uh, our CSM model produced too few objects, so not enough precipitation. And again, they are also too far north. This third peak that's seen in our observations is over kind of the Thailand area is not really well captured in the model. And so what we did here is we took these frequency maps and we fed that data back into mode to get object statistics on these frequency maps. And this is what that looks like. In this case, I'm showing a threshold of greater than or equal to 35% although we tried a few different thresholds in this case. And I've labeled the three objects so that we can compare them between the model and the observation. So uh, first, looking at our area ratio, in this case, I'm using model divided by observation. So our model is producing areas that are large, too large. Uh, area one specifically is three times the size the other ones are close, but still larger than they should be. Um, additionally, our objects are located further to the east in the model. Uh, this is especially evident in object three, which is just in the wrong location, which is why it's not matched. Um, additionally, model objects two and three are oriented more east-west than they are in the observation. So their axis is more north-south in the observation, and it's more east-west. Um, in, in, the, uh, in the model. And then finally, uh, the symmetric difference is quite large for objects two and three. That uh, is a result of one of the spatial offset for object three, but also uh, the uh, orientation error in object two. And then, so finally, uh, monsoon mode summary statistics. So instead of looking at the frequency uh, the, these tables show the summary statistics over the whole time period using a period of 80 to 100 east. And this slide does include all lead times rather than just the 24 hour lead time. And so we're looking at uh, several variables, area, centroid latitude, centroid longitude, and intensity. And then I have kind of the distribution, min, max, mean, and standard deviation. And so when all lead times are included, we can see that the area in the CESM model is larger, both the max and the mean area is larger. Also, the 90% intensity max is a lot larger in our CESM model than it is in the observations, but the other variables are similar. So all lead times, in addition or similarly to the 24-hour lead time, are also showing larger areas, and in this case, they're too intense but the uh, spatial or the northward offset that we saw in the 24 hour lead time is less evident in uh, the location statistics here. So uh, with that, we will go ahead and move on to the next case, which is the hail evaluation. Now this was run during the HWT spring experiments in 2019 and 2020, it was run in real time. Uh, I'm gonna share results from 2019 here. And what we were looking at was model hail size from the hurry e which is a three kilometer convection allowing model. So there were three different hail calculations run inside this model, uh, Thompson microphysics, machine learning, and then also hail cast. And unfortunately, these three calculations were up during diff at different time frames during the experiment. Uh, hail cast didn't start till very late in the experiment. So the sample size isn't great but it's what we have to work with. Uh, the observations come uh, from MRMS mesh. And specifically, I'll be showing results for the zero uh, UTC initialization time, one to 36 hour leads at hourly resolutions. Uh, the data comes from Monday through Friday and it's on the daily domain. If you're unfamiliar with the project, they uh, pick a box over the United States each day 
where they expect severe weather to occur. And so the actual region varies, but, um, but uh, it's always over the United States. So here, uh, unlike previous where we were looking at summary statistics and percentages, uh, here we did contingency table statistics, and we showed those on a performance diagram, which I'm showing to the right here. Uh, the performance diagram shows the probability of detection versus the success ratio, and you want to be up near the green. That would be the best performance with a high probability of detection or and low false alarms. So what's unique about this case is that we only considered matched pairs. And the reason to do this is because our convective uh, hazards suffer from an additional penalty. And what I mean by that is a convection allowing model has to first produce convection. And if it doesn't produce convection, it's most certainly not going to produce your convective hazard. And so in the case where it doesn't produce convection, we don't want to penalize the HAIL algorithm in that case. So if I'm only looking at matched pairs, how do I ever get false alarms and misses? And here I have an example of how that happens. It happens because I'm using a 0.5 inch convolution threshold, but the threshold hail sizes that we're looking for are higher than that. They could be uh, one and a half or two inches. So in this example, I'm looking at two inches. And this is a 26 hour hail cast forecast uh, on May 29th, 2019. I have highlighted three objects here. And uh, object one, you can see the maximum hail size forecast is below the two inch threshold for both the model and the observations. So this would be classified as a correct null. For object two, the hail size is above two inches for both the forecast and the observations. So that would be classified as a hit. And object three, the forecast shows hail above two inches while the observation does not. So this would be considered a false alarm. And so the stats are tallied this way uh, rather than how they are normally tallied for con contingency table statistics. And then these blue objects here are unmatched and they're not considered. So this is uh, two performance diagrams. And the left is one and a half inch hail and the right is two inch hail. And we're showing Thompson Microphysics in blue, machine learning in green, and uh, hail cast in red. And so right off the bat, um, the uh, Thompson Microphysics never produced two inch hail throughout the experiment. And at the one and a half inch threshold, it had a low probability of detection with uh, varying false alarms, although they're you know, towards the lower area. In contrast, our machine learning had a high probability of detection, also with varying false alarms. Uh, Hailcast here, there really isn't enough data. It was up for only about a week and a half. Um, so there's not enough data to determine a trend, although the probability of detection does go down at the higher or two inch threshold. So lastly, uh, we will move on to the brightness temperature evaluation. And in this case, we're examining brightness temperatures less than or equal to 235 Kelvin. So we're comparing convective weather signatures. In this case, looking at the FV3 ensemble members model, which is also a three kilometer convection allowing model. Uh, the date I'm showing in this presentation is May 21st, 2019. It's a zero hour initialization time and a one hour forecast. Uh, and I'm only gonna show two members in this case for clarity. That will be compared to the GOES channel 13 observations. And in this case, we're comparing ensemble members, but also creating distance maps from the object-based field after mode is run. So this is where grid stat sneaks in. Uh, and then to the right here, I have an example of what the precipitation field on that day looks like. So this is uh, the output objects for two members, the LSM1 and MP1 member. 
uh, comparing the two, and I have highlighted three objects that are present in both of the members and that are matched in both of the members. So one, two, three is a little bit hard to see. And when we look down here at the area ratios, the model is producing too small of areas of brightness temperatures, with the MP1 being smaller than LSM1, especially for object number three. So uh, they're, both models are producing too small of areas, MP1 more so. Uh, in terms of angle distance, object one has a very close orientation in both the LSM1 and the MP1, but objects two and three are you know, 30 to 45 degrees off axis for the two models. Also, uh, something to note here, there's just fewer objects present in MP1 than we see in our LSM1 model. So uh, less of a, in this case, the LSM1 had a slightly better forecast. Um, now, uh, moving on to object-based distance maps. If you're unfamiliar with distance maps, it's distance between every grid point and the nearest non-zero grid point. And the distance maps in this case were computed off the object field. Uh, so I'm showing the LSM1 distance map and the GOES distance map over here on the right. I don't have the MP1 listed, but uh, I do have some of the distance-based metrics shown for both in the table here. So our LSM1 member has smaller distances than our MP1 member, except the minimum mean error distance right here. Um, and our Hausdorff score is very close between the two. And so this agrees with the object-based results in that uh, we want a smaller distance. Smaller distance indicates a better forecast in this case. And so this also suggests that the LSM1 member performed better than the MP1 member. So to summarize, I showed three different ways to use mode output. Uh, from a climate model where we looked at object frequency, statistics on object frequency for a season, and then also use mode analysis to compute summary statistics over that seasonal time period. A hail size forecast from a convection aligning model, where in this case, we only considered matched pairs to remove that additional penalty that conductive hazards suffer from and uh, displayed the results on performance diagrams. And then finally, brightness temperature, where we did comparison of ensemble members and the use of objects to create distance maps. So different post-processing gives different information. Uh, and what you do with mode output depends on what you want to do. So um, with that, uh, I could take questions if there's time. Yes, I think there is time for at least one quick question. I don't see anything on the chat, but if you want to raise your hand or speak up, please go ahead. Hearing none, I have a very basic question. So, you know, I, I saw the, uh, for comparisons, you uh, included all the lead times you know, while computing the scores, I'm always, you know, thinking whether it's a, you know, good idea to lump all the lead times in or so what was the recommended, you know, way to do things like when you look at the stats with the, will the long term, you know, long lead times will take over the statistics? What, what's your opinion? Um, so in the case of the climate model, and I didn't, I didn't have time to show all the results. We actually did it both ways. We did a 24 hour lead time and all lumped in. And the statistics did change, um, although some features were present in both. So in that, for the climate model anyways, didn't take over uh, all the statistics. Um, for the convection allowing model or the case of HWT, I think the theory there is that you're tracking convection throughout time over your daily domain, which is actually quite a small region. So the impact in that case on the differing lead times is less. The, the brightness temperature does evaluate the lead times individually. So I, I guess for me, I think it depends on your situation uh, and, and what you're doing with it. Okay. Will you have your hand raised? If you have a very quick question, 
we'll take that. Yeah, um, I'm just starting to get into the machine learning um, analysis, and I was just curious what um, configuration and scheme you were using for the this machine learning uh, case. The mode configurations? Yes, ma'am. Um, so I don't recall all of them off the top of my head, but uh, I can give the link to the use case. I'll put it in the chat. Um, and that will show the configuration file that'll have the listing of all of them, um, which might Thank be you. the easiest way to answer that question. Okay. Thank you. I think in the interest of time, we'll move forward. Uh, Nicholas, are you ready? Uh, yes, I'm ready. Yeah, uh, please, let's see. Please, please. If I can do my, maybe my entire screen might be better. Um, yeah, share now. Yeah. And, so uh, Nicholas, let's see. Yeah, he was speaking on Metplus feature relative diagnostics applied to Hurricane East size 2020. Yes, it's an interesting name. Um, yeah. But, uh, um, so you can all see this, right? I don't see any slides right now. You don't see any slides. Nope. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I have it on share. Let me try this again. Um, how about uh, now? Yes. I okay. Now. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Um, so anyway, yes. Um, just I want to give a quick shout out first to uh, Brian Cully here at Stony Brook and Paul, Tara, and John down there at NCAR for helping me with all this, in which I'll just simply be showing um, how I apply MET plus feature relative diagnostics to Hurricane Isaias of 2020. So, uh oh, there we go. Um, so during the earlier stages of Isaias, um, the GFS forecast model tended to struggle a little bit with the uh, track forecast. And I show an example of this for the 12 UTC July 28th cycle, where the GFS forecast is shown in red, um, drifted too far to the north and east by about 300 kilometers, corresponding to a right of track error, in comparison to the um, observation or the best track as shown in black. Now, while afterwards compensating factors steered the forecast back to the observation, that wasn't until the damage is already done, when in reality the storm made landfall over the Dominican Republic and the GFS struggled to emulate this. Meanwhile, many large track error cases correspond to errors in the synoptic steering flow developing early in the forecast due to feedbacks from the TC's convection. And these errors are best viewed in a vortex-centered framework to isolate differences in the environmental steering versus those due to the TC's displacement. So the question I want to answer is if there are any similar near-TC processes contributing to the GFS's right-of-track error for this case. So more specifically, I want to demonstrate how METS feature relative functionality can verify gridded meteorological fields in this vortex-centered framework and then derive various metrics, such as divergence, lapse rates, and such, from the gridded fields related to Hurricane Isaias's track forecast, and then apply these to different data sets besides the default GFS. And so I just show a very simplified flow diagram, since we know that MetPlus is a pretty big machine, to show that the, to only show the functions that um, I used for my case, starting with TC's pairs and TC stat, which um, processed the model and observed track data for the tropical cyclone, and then regrid data plane, which extracts and interpolates the tiles from the gridded meteorological fields centered on this track data. And then series analysis, which in this case ultimately matches and compares the observed and model tiles. And all that I'll be showing in this talk, including the configurations and original data and such, is contained within this Google Drive link for your convenience. So I'll be mostly focusing on, hour, on forecast hours 0 through 24 of the 12 UTC July 28th cycle and looking at the 0.5 degree GFS forecast grid verified against the 0.5 degree ECMWF analysis and the 0.25 degree ERA-5 reanalysis, treating these two like the observation. And all of these uh, grids are archived within these respective links. So meanwhile, the A and B deck data sets contain the location and intensity of tropical cyclones as given by the model forecast and the uh, NHC best track reanalysis respectively. So MET first uses TC pairs and TC stat um, to again process the latitudes and longitudes within these files. And then the gridded data is centered on these coordinates to create these N by N tiles. So more specifically, 
I centered the GFS gridded fields on the GFS forecast track position, as shown in this example. Whereas the ESMWF analysis and ERA-5 reanalysis, I centered on the best track position. And for both, I used the default 30 by 30 degree tile size. So just some other details. Um, I did this a while a while back. So I was using MetPlus version 4.0.0 on the Cheyenne supercomputer. And um, the feature relative diagnostics in this case require two configure files, one for system and one for data. And it's this data configure file that will greatly depend on the diagnostics you wish to perform and thereby require extensive edits that I won't have time to go into. But there is a comment module coming out that will help uh, guide you through many of these details, which uh, Paul will be giving a talk on afterwards. So I strongly encourage you to uh, stay tuned for that. So I just ran this um, feature relative use case for a simple verification. And by that, I mean just verifying fields available within the raw forecast and analysis files, such as comparing your standard UN temperature and, and so forth. Now, by default, MetPlus will automatically run this plot data plane function to, to plot the outputted forecast analysis and error tiles for each forecast hour. And this function can be rerun afterwards um, to plot the data from each of these tiles, which are contained in these series analysis NetCDF files, with some degree of customization. That is, I found that you can at least center um, the color scale so that it's consistently um, centered about zero for all the times plotted. But there is one, one minor caveat that I found, and I don't know if it's been fixed, but um, I noticed that the function incorrectly plots the forecast tile as if it were centered on the best track position, even though it really is centered on the GFS track. And that's because the series analysis file that it's reading only has the best track latitude and longitude. It's missing that of the GFS. And so just as proof of this, I show here the 700 millibar heights of the analysis versus the GFS forecast at hour 24, where if you look very closely, you can see that the geographic contours in both plots are identical. Despite at this point in the forecast, the GFS position drifting some 2.4 degrees east of the best track. However, this forecast latitude and longitude can be found within the NetCDF files generated a step earlier via the regrid data plane function. But at the end of the day, I found that it was easier just to plot everything, all these outputted NetCDF files with my own script to make more complex plots like the ones I show below. So what these are showing are um, the 850 to 700 millibar height errors as shaded and the steering flow errors as given by the barbs, as well as the analysis heights as given by the black contours at hour zero, 12 and 24. And what this is showing you is that the GFS is under predicting the uh, the heights to the north and east of Isaias. And that is, so as you go forward in time to hour 12, these negative height errors grow to the north of Isaias and become cons um, consistent with a westerly steering flow error. So really what's happening is that this subtropical ridge you see to the north is locally weakening, and hence the easterly steering flow is weakening, thus corresponding to the GFS drifting more to the north over time. And because this is in a TC center framework, we can confirm that these underpredicted heights are not just an artifact of displacement errors in the height perturbation associated with the TC itself, that they are indeed attached, at least locally, to the subtropical ridge. But then that begs the question, though, what are causing these erroneous height falls in the model? So for that, I turn to the embedded Python script functionality um, to just derive quantities with, um, from variables within the raw files. Now, by default, this is um, all set up to run four Python scripts for a different case and calculate the uh, column potential vorticity and integrated vapor transport of the forecast and analysis. And these fields are then processed much like before by the regrid data plane step. So I replaced these Python scripts with my own for carrying out these other calculations, such as those that calculate uh, layer lapse rate, uh, specific humidity, and precipitation rate, and so forth though these all require very careful edits of the configure file. And also, you'll need a separate Python script for each of these variables calculated for reasons I won't have time to go into, but um, as far as I know, you can't do all this with just one embedded Python script. But all the, all the same, I found some very interesting results in that um, starting off when looking at the 1,000 to 700 millibar uh, temperature difference or lapse rate of the EC analysis on the left, 
versus the GFS in the center. And then looking at the difference, the GFS minus EC analysis or the GFS error, that you see in the initial, that these being the initial conditions that at the start of the forecast, the GFS lapse rates are too negative to the west and south of Isaias. That is, there's too much instability. And also in the initial conditions, when you look at the 700 millibar specific humidity, you see that in the same manner, the GFS over that same region is too moist. And with too much moisture and with too much instability, it's no surprise that if you were to look at the, um, the precipitation rates, that the GFS in comparison to, well, actually this should say the ERA-5 reanalysis, that in comparison to that data, to, to that analysis, that the GFS is producing too much convection to the west of Isaias during the first zero to six hours. And because you have too much convection to the west of Isaias, you can imagine that you have a stronger divergent outflow during the subsequent 12 to 24 hours, as shown here in these 300 millibar uh, divergence plots, that when you look at the difference or the error, that the GFS divergence is too strong to the north of Isaias. And this nicely coincides with that region I showed earlier in which the heights are falling too much in the model, thus consistent with the, um, the ridge weakening. And, and that makes sense because with stronger divergence aloft, you have more uh, mass removal from the column and hence surface or low level pressure falls. And thus explaining again why the ridge weakens and hence why the, this, it's failing to steer the TC far enough to the west. So then just very quickly, I'll go over something I did purely as a proof of concept and then I wasn't sure what would happen, not for any scientific questions. So I tested this function, this, um, well, whether if I can extract certain parameters from other data sets such as WARF for a different case, Hurricane Elsa of 2021. More specifically, I was seeing if I can extract um, variables from the WARF GFS and WARF NAM, which are two versions of WARF that we run operationally here at Stony Brook. Um, with initialized with the GFS and NAM uh, conditions. And this model is run down to four kilometer resolution. And for the sake of time, I'll only be showing the results for the six hour forecast of the 12 UTC July 9th cycle, in which I just wanted to see if I can actually extract the planetary boundary layer height, a 2D parameter that's outputted by WARF. And as has been discussed before, um, whenever you're in doubt whether a, a file variable is compatible with MetPlus, you can always run the plot data plane function in the manner seen below. And if it is, you really won't need any embedded Python scripts, though you will still have to be careful with the configure file. And um, just for the sake of the simple test, I centered both grids of, from both versions of WARF on ELSA's best track position and interpolated the extracted tile to a 0 0.05 degree resolution. Just to see if it would work, if MetPlus would successfully extract the tiles, and I would say it did. That in comparison to the original data set shown here, that when you look at the extracted tiles that MetPlus creates, that they are very similar or almost identical with only minute differences that are purely due to the interpolation. And so when I have two minutes, Two minutes? Okay. Yeah. So when I have, if I have more time in the future, I'll see if I could apply this same uh, procedure to other variables in WARF, such as diabetic heating. And just to conclude, well, yeah, to summarize that NetPlus provides a succinct way of centering the verification of gridded fields on the storm position. And it works in tandem with embedded Python scripts to allow for complex diagnostics. And it works on many data sets, including WARF, and can process variables such as PBL height and microphysical parameters. And while it would be amicable to for there to be more built-in plotting utilities within NET with greater customization, at least the NET CDF files that are outputted can be read by most languages, and thus you might as well just use your own scripts to make your own uh, plots. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. I don't see any questions in the chat. We have time for one very quick question. Okay. Yep, yeah, Mohan, go ahead. Is it in the chat? Oh yeah, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, fine. Nicholas, nice talk. Yeah, I was just uh, wondering um, in your flow diagram, you you show you show us the TC stat, TC page, and then it goes to a gridded data. Uh, like yeah, the middle one, regrid the data plane yes. by using using the track center as a tile, something like that, right? So, so how does it go? Like you know, TC page and TC stat, it gives you the um which which track it will con consider for the uh, as a center like you know best track or the well, uh, model 
Well, for the um, GFS forecast, I um, centered it for the GFS forecast. I centered it on the GFS forecast track. And meanwhile, the ECMWVF analysis and reanalysis, I centered on the best track. So I was so I can control which um, which 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 of these which each of these gridded data sets, which um, um, track they're centered on. If that answers okay. your question. Uh, I mean, like, do you think if I if I if instead of GFS track, if I use the best track in both the things, um, do the results uh, remain the same, or do you expect some changes in the results if I use the A model? In Other this than, case, uh, yeah. yes, because in this case, I think you might begin to see more negative height perturbations that might be more of an artifact of the TC's displacement because it has in and of itself <laughs> its own low perturbation. So. It would probably affect the results to some degree. I haven't tested that though, but I've seen it for other cases that I looked in this manner. Okay, fine. Thank you. I, Jai, I, I see yeah. your hand raised. If you can <laughs> ask your question on the chat because we want to ah. keep it on time. Yes, yeah, thank you. Okay, All right. thank you. I'll check the chat then. All right, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Should I so, stop sharing? Right. Yep. So next up is Paul Kuchera. He'll be describing the Comet module. Paul, are you here? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Can you see my screen all right? Yes. Great. Thanks, Bizwas. Um, I apologize in advance. I'm, I'm working my way through COVID right now, but uh, I'm happy uh, to be here to uh, Share my presentation. Um, it's been some great, great talks up to this point um, using using um, Met Met Plus. So I want to uh, really shift gears and uh, briefly talk about um, some educational resources on how to actually use some of these tools. And this has been a um, a great collaboration between um, the training and outreach group at Comet here at UCAR. Uh, the uh, the RAL team with with Met Met Plus, and then our colleagues at, at SUNY Stony Brook uh, and, and Nicholas gave a uh, a great great talk just before me here on on some of the tools and, and the collaborations that we worked on through this this project. Just a brief introduction um, for my um, kind of going going around and meeting with people around the world. Common is is well known for its its Met Ed resources, but in case you're not familiar. Um, Comet's been around for over 30 years now and is really focused on developing uh, customized training on a variety of topics from weather to, to climate. Um, if you search on the MedEd website, there's over 240,000 hours of free educational resources on these a variety of different topics. So it's a, it's a great resource for those who remain not familiar with it to, to really gain further understanding of different topics. So with that, uh, the, the key platform is MedEd. Um, it has over 600 different kinds of lessons on 20 different topics. There's over a million users now. It's free and open. <clears throat> you can learn at your own pace. Uh, you just need to sign in or log or sign up, I should say, through MedEd. Um, and it's free and you have access to all this material. And um, just to highlight, uh, I, I just did a quick search the other day, and there's currently um, looking for verification resources. There's there's currently five lessons, including the one I'm going to talk about here today. Um, uh, if you want to go and dig a little more into ver a variety of verification modules, um, and there's there's a lot more on numerical weather prediction, for example, if you if you want to further explore. So we're hoping to broaden this these um, areas and offerings. And, terms of lessons, but this is what's available now. So today I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on uh, the module that we recently developed and uh, was published here at the beginning of the year. And that's the uh, um, the Met Plus Verification Software and Diagnostic Model BIOS module. Um, and this is just a screenshot of, of the opening page to start the lesson. So it, it provides an opportunity to uh, pre-assessment to test your knowledge. There's there's quizzes again to test your knowledge, and then of course the, the content. And I'll explain a little bit more about that coming up. <clears throat> so the objective of this 
um, module is to, to really uh, help you develop a better understanding of using series analysis and future relative base analysis um, that was discussed in the previous presentation. List the um, advantages of the MET plus diagnostic tools for performing uh, feature relative verification in comparison to other evaluation tools that are available. Um, be able to learn how to interpret statistical outputs from MET plus. Um, and then we apply this interpretation, or you will apply it if you go through the module, um, of these outputs for a, ca a case study. So looking at a hurricane feature. Um, and then uh, evaluate these feature relative outputs um, by comparing model output to the um, ver verification data set. So one of the um, things, as I mentioned before, there's, there's a, um, a, in a lot of these modules that's developed through Comet, there's, there's a lot of a kind of a reinforcement of, of knowledge. So you could take a, a pre-assessment, basically a quiz, and, and test in your knowledge before you take the the module and then there will be a you can take the quiz afterwards and see if you've actually learned the content and, and reinforced the knowledge that was in, in the module itself so and here's just an example so you can you can go through this pre-assessment and, and take the quiz and that'll help you guide on that and your baseline of, of what you know about uh, um, met plus before you start and then you can then again take the quiz afterwards one of the um, great things about this, this particular module is that it has a lot of great links to a lot of great resources. So say you're wondering about, for example, GridStat. Um, if you click on that link, it'll take you to uh, another page um, provided by the uh, MET team. And then you can learn more about GridStat or PointStat um, and all the different tools. So there's there's lots of resources built into the module itself to, to really help uh, enforce um, what you're trying to learn to, through this module. So here's just an example. If you click on grid, grid stat, you'll come to um, a presentation by John Holly Gatway uh, in the past. Um, there's links to um, evaluations of, for example, uh, extratropical cyclones using the feature relative methods um, provided by Tara uh, in, in previous presentations. So there's a lot, a lot of resources available to you to really help you learn and understand and use, use the tools. So now I just want to kind of briefly go through um, the module itself. Again, this is um, just just basically snapshots of, of what you uh, you'll go through when you look at, at the, the module. So first of all, the the module takes you kind of takes you through basically a storyline of using um, an example data sets to to apply and and see how you can use these different tools. First of all, you would start with uh, introduction to series analysis. I'm um, using this example data set. Look at error trends. And then it moves on to um, into introduction to feature relative analysis um, and so on. So here's an example for um, one of the hurricanes that we evaluated, um, looking at, in this case, a two meter temperature forecast in comparison to the evaluation data set. Um, here's just an example of looking at doing uh, air trend analysis, looking at the differences between the model and the evaluation data set in this example and seeing the, the biases that you would see between the two, two data sets for this particular uh, forecast hour for, for the temperature. <clears throat> What's also a nice feature of the, um, of the excuse me, of the uh, module itself is it provides you, again, uh, kind of uh, learning and further understanding of how you do different types of analysis for for example, here's um, different methods. You could do series analysis for, for example, you could look at, um, you can hold the initialization constant and look at the, the differences between different models, for example, on the left side. On the right side, here's an example of you, you'd hold the valid, ti valid times constant, but you look at different initialization times and how they compare in terms of, of the different forecasts. And then um, uh, there's a discussion and examples of holding the, uh, the forecast hours constant. So again, you can, again, a variety of different ways and tools to, to for those who are not maybe familiar with verification to kind of come up with and, and understand and learn more about how you go about your particular analysis. What's integrated throughout the entire module um, 
maybe everybody's afraid of taking quizzes after going to school, but I, I find um, taking these these questions, there's questions embedded within uh, the module itself, the pre-assessment, as I mentioned before, there's a, a quiz at the end, all just to reinforce and test your knowledge um, as you go through. And what's something that's unique, unique um, that's been recently added to a lot of the comment modules is booster questions. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about booster questions at the very end, but it's a, another way to reinforce what you've learned and apply it to your research and analysis. Another great tool, so now focus on just uh, some examples of feature analysis. Uh, the tool allows you to, to scan through and look at uh, the differences between the two fields. So on the left, if, you, if, you, if you're in the module and you, you move your mouse back and forth, left and right, you can look at the differences between your observation data set or your analysis data set in your, your forecast to, to look at the biases in a visual, visual way um, and help you kind of understand where, where this differences uh, may be. And here's just an example of looking at precipital water um, mean airfields for, for the hurricane. And then you can do um, analysis looking at the feature base of that particular system. And here again, here's the differences now. Um, look at the mean air and you can see the different biases for, for the hurricane. Uh, in this case of um, overestimation, underestimation uh, focused on, on the hurricane location itself. So you can immediately see where the, where those different features are. And you can see the different bands of, of precipitation that would was forecasted and then um, evaluated in the, in the data sets for this example. Then what's nice about the feature-based uh, verification tool, it, it provides opportunities to look at um, ways to customize your user diagnostic features and evaluations. Um, so here's just an example of looking at uh, the 300 millibar divergent errors for the same event, looking at the um, 1,000 to 700 millibar temperature um, differences, and Nicholas talked about this in his case study, so I won't go into any details, but they just show right away if you, you focus on a particular feature and you can pull out these really unique uh, features and the differences and the difference between the model and the evaluation. Um, data set. So it's, really, it's a really great way to, to kind of diagnose and understand the performance of, of the model itself. So um, just wanted to kind of go back to what I, what I mentioned uh, before is one of the great things, again, um, a, a great uh, training resources, and I think most of you understand it. So if you go back to when you were uh, in class, you'd be, you'd be taught dynamics or some other um, thing in class. And as soon as you left class, you start to forget it, right? Until maybe you had to study for the test. Well, what's great about booster questions is that um, they get sent out to you by email in um, a variety of ways, say maybe a week after you take the course, two weeks, a month, six months, and it helps you retain the knowledge that you, you've, uh, you've learned while you're taking that knowledge. So if you take, you have these booster questions, they'll give you a, give you a question or two, helps you reinforce what you learn. You can always go back to the module. And over time, you've, you've learned and gained and retained more and more of, of that knowledge. So if I, I would recommend, if you do this, is to sign up for these booster questions for this module or any of the other ones that you might take through the, the Comet website. So yeah, just a great, great resource. Well, so just two minutes. Yep, um, this is my last slide, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> so just to summarize, uh, uh, through this, this presentation, I just gave a really brief introduction to the feature revenue analysis um, plus uh, module, a focus on serious analysis, feature relative analysis. Uh, is, it's applied to a case study. Um, Hurricane, in this example, um, has lots of access to MET plus documentation for further reading and reinforcement of, of the knowledge. Um, quizzes to reinforce that content. And then I'll just leave you with some of the um, references as part of the development of the feature relative um, tools here. So with that, I'll stop and I thank you for your time and I think maybe there's time for a question or two. So thank you. Sure, we have time for at least one quick question. I'll ask Bisbos a question. Oh, say, 
Have you taken any comment modules? This was yes, previously, yeah. Okay, I've used comment before. Yeah, we'll go ahead. Are there other met um, comment modules other than the one you listed? For I know the tutorial is an excellent um, source for learning the basics of met, but I was wondering if there is a guided tutorial through comment. Uh, there currently is not. Um, we've we've talked about um, expanding our collaboration between Comet and and the Met group to to provide additional resources. So um, I don't know if Tara is still on, but oh, there she is. But anyway, I but the idea is is to further provide further resources into the future. Okay, I think next step is Tracy. So Tracy will be talking about using MetBlast to assess impactful snow events. Tracy, you're up now. Thank you, Viswas. Mm -hmm. and... Okay, okay. So I'm going to be discussing a number of MetPlus use cases that can be used to assess impactful snow events. And I'd like to acknowledge the co-authors as well as the MetPlus team that have pro provided significant um, development and enhancements for these use cases. All right. This work is a, a um, part of an ongoing project um, that's two years in response to the Joint Technology Transfer and Initiative effort between NCAR and WPC. It aims to apply and enhance existing MetPlus capabilities in relation to snowfall prediction as well as high impact events that can be used um, to, to, to streamline evaluation and diagnostic investigations. So the goal is to then integrate these use cases into WPC's routine model evaluations by the end of year two. So there are four use cases that we are working on applying and refining for our current year one, and they include the feature relative use case, and that's originally developed in collaboration with Stony Brook University for cyclone relative verification. Um, and then for this project, we're interested in verification relative to snow bands. The second use case is multivariate mode and was originally developed to identify dry lines. And then I'm sure a majority of you are already familiar with mode, the method for object-based diagnostic evaluation for identifying objects in a single field. So multivariate mode combines two or more fields to identify super objects. And then forecast consistency provides a measure of stability of a forecast across forecast cycles. And then the difficulty index, which was contributed by the uh, NRL, uh, provides guidance on how difficult a forecast may be um, based on a set of forecasts, such as an ensemble. And as already mentioned, we have a heavy focus on snow band events. And listed here are seven cases of interest um, with heavy banded snowfall located um, over the Northeast um, area. And then the data we use includes the one hour HER forecasts versus the MRMS products. Um, and that provides a one hour multi-sensor QPE product um, as well as a precipitation type. Um, so we also use a modified CONUS East mask um, and that's applied to filter out unwanted objects as much as possible. And that's shown here in the red. And then just to show an example, I have the event from early February 2021 shown in the bottom plots. So the left figure is looping through the mode time domain snowband objects, um, where HER is in blue and MRMS is in red over a 48-hour forecast period. And then on the right, we have the WPC's 24-hour 24 24-hour accumulation of the event uh, with a narrow cor corridor reporting over 30 inches of snow. And so um, our all of our uh, snow band events are very similar to this type of event. So the first case that I'm going to look at is the feature relative. So for this use case, we are ingesting the HER gridded forecast data and the gridded MRMS products. We're also using the HER analysis. And then the GenVX mask tool is used to mask the accumulated precipitation field using categorical snow um, to get those snow bands. And then that output is read into mode time domain to identify our snow snow band objects um, for each of our cases. And then from that, the object centroids are used as the tracks of the snow band event. And a tile that's relative to the centroid is extracted using the extract tiles um, met tool. 
So these tiles are then ingested into the series analysis um, to compute the aggregated statistics of various um, fields relative to the snow band object. And then by aggregating over a number of similar cases, we can identify systematic biases in the model. So I have listed here the main mode time domain settings that were used, and those include a uh, convolution threshold uh, greater than or equal to uh, 0.05 inches, convolution radius of five grid points, and a minimum volume of 1,000 grid points. And for the extract tiles, a 30 by 30 degree tile with quarter inch degree uh, grid spacing is centered over the object. All right, so here we have series analysis output from the seven combined cases um, to diagnose any systematic uh, biases in the region for these types of events. So these images are of accumulated precipitation uh, per versus MRMS, greater than or equal to 0.05 inches in an hour. And those are masked with categorical snow and the east uh, uh, modified East Conus mask. And the plot in the upper right uh, corner has the total counts um, and the highest counts are located around the centroid, as you would expect, um, with the yellow colors being about n equals 100 um, data points, and that decreases outward. So the mean error is plotted on the left and RMSE is on the right, and the little black cross in the plots are the center of the tile or the snowband object. So just to note that we were able to capture the southwest to northeast snowband objects um, fairly well with this case. And the biases are at most two to three millimeters. Um, in the one hour accumulations with a, a, a high snowfall bias near the center and in the uh, southeast quadrant. So we're also investigating various mechanisms that drive snow band behavior. These are series analysis plots of the HER forecast versus the HER analysis um, with no masks, masks applied for uh, various variables. And here we see that the heights are too low over the snow band centroid and downstream um, when you're looking at the 850 and 700 millibar on the left and the uh, mean sea level pressure on the, the top right. And so perhaps the low is just too strong in the model and a bit too slow. Uh, the 250 millibar wind speed uh, bias is also quite interesting. I'm not gonna go over these in detail, but just showing some examples. Um, here we have plots of temperature um, showing that the model is generally too cold to the north and uh, too warm uh, to, to the south of the centroid. And looking at relative humidity, it's generally too moist, um, uh, with the main exception to the south and west of the centroid um, at 500 millibars. So the second use case um, demonstrates how, how to run multivariate mode. So for this use case, um, we started with gridded forecast and analysis data and um, those were directly ingested into the mode tool um, to run multivariate mode. So I'm gonna go over in more detail how to set up the multivariate mode in the next slides. So multivariate mode output will provide the usual mode output for each included variable. So however many variables you ingested into multivariate mode, it's gonna output the usual mode output for those. Um, and it's also gonna create um, forecast and observation super objects. And those super objects are basically a mask type file of zeros and hundreds, um, in our case, uh, where, the her, where the hundreds are the super object. So it doesn't include um, attribute statistics um, of, the, of the identified super objects. And so there's an extra step that needs to be made here within your use case if you want that information. And so from this, you can take one of two paths. You can run multivariate mode to create your super objects. And then you can ingest your uh, forecast and observation super objects um, back into mode, um, running it as usual to get attribute information on the super objects themselves, such as object area or centroid displacement, um, et cetera. Um, if you desire attribute information statistics such as percentile intensities, um, then there's an extra step that you need to um, make. So you would run multivariate mode to create your forecast and observation super objects and then you would run GenVX mask on uh, your variable of interest um, and uh, using the super objects as your, your mask to do the data masking. And then you would um, ingest those data mask fields um, into mode and run mode as usual and, um, and uh, to, to get your usual mode output. And I'll go ahead and uh, step through this second process in the next slides. 
So in order to run multivariate mode within the Netflix use case, um, a logical expression needs to be defined. And if it is not defined in your configuration file, then mode's going to run as usual. So the logic, logical expression is called mode multivar logic, and that is only available currently in uh, the 5.0 uh, beta 1. Um, so it will be in, um, included in the next uh, main release. Um, so this is an example using Blizzard-like objects. Um, so for those, we define these objects to have a precipitation type of snow, a wind speed greater than or equal to 35 miles per hour, and a visibility um, less than or equal to a quarter mile. So we want uh, a super object that includes the intersection of all of these. So our logical expression for this is going to be field number one and number two and number three to get that um, intersection. Uh, additionally, for each variable um, that you define um, in the logical expression, an input template needs to be defined that points to the file that contains each variable. Um, and so if you have um, these three variables that are input, you need to point to the path of um, the file that contains each of the variables. If they're all in the same file, then you point to that path three times so that it knows that where to look for those variables. <clears throat> so multivariate mode is going to produce NetCDF files um, that contain um, the forecast and observation super objects, um, as, as you see here. Um, and in our case, the objects have a value of 100 and everywhere else is zero. So these are our Blizzard objects at a specific time for the forecast and observation. And then using GenVX mask, you can data mask um, any field. Um, we masked the wind speeds, the 10 meter wind speeds here, um, using those um, super objects. Um, and then you can input that into mode um, to pro produce the usual mode statistics. So this is just um, the example from um, one of our snowband cases that had blizzard conditions um, in it. So we were just playing with the, the identifying the blizzard here. So the top um, left is a movie loop of the forecast super objects with ob observation super object outlines um, for the blizzard case. And that goes from forecast hour 12 to 36, so 24 hour period. Um, I've also included uh, time series plots of some of the mode statistics for this time period um, for the super object. Um, for example, we see that for mode, uh, mode super object area, the her forecast, which is in blue, has uh, larger blizzard-like objects um, from forecast hour 12 to 24. And during that same period, looking at 90th percentile intensity for 10 meter winds, um, the, the intensity is stronger for the her um, forecast as well. Um, as for centroid displacement in this plot here, um, the blue line is the south to north displacement and shows a positive northern displacement. And the red line is the west to east displacement, showing a slight westward displacement at a number of times. So, so this is just to show um, that you can get the same type of uh, verification from the multivariate mode use case. Um, so while this is currently run as a use case for now, I mean, you have to do all these steps in the configuration. Um, there are plans for future development to execute all these steps under the MetPlus hood. So next we'll look at forecast consistency. Um, for this use case, um, only the gridded forecast data is used. Um, for our purpose, I use GenBS mask to mask the snowband objects using categorical snow. And then that is ingested into mode time domain. So from the mode time domain output, the revision series um, to determine forecast consistency is then computed in MetCalcPy and MetViewer. And then the revisions can be plotted in MetViewer and MetPlotPy. So this capability of calculating and plotting um, in MetCalcPy and MetPlotPy um, is currently under development. Um, and then um, you should then compute revision stick statistics such as the Wald Wolfowitz run test and the autocorrelation statistic, which are currently available in Metcalc Pi. <clears throat> so as mentioned before, forecast consistency provides a measure of stability of an updating forecast across forecast cycles. Um, and so for running this use case in Met Plus, mode time domain is run in reverse. So um, and valid hours kept constant. And then the objects and events of interest are tracked through time with decreasing lead time through your cycles. So the changes in the object from one time to another 
which are also called the revisions, are then computed for each object separately. And that's using the, um, the 2D Moton domain attribute. Um, for example, you might want to look at the revisions of area or intensity. So if the forecast remains consistent as the event nears, then there is more confidence in that forecast. So the example I have here is from the 16th of December snowband case uh, using hourly HER cycles from 12, 16, 12 UTC to 12, 17, 6 UTC of 2020. So while keeping constant uh, valid time of 12, 17 at 6 UTC, um, we can see visually in the plot um, on the left how the object changes as, as the event nears. So in this plot, um, we're looking at the the object at this valid time um, with decreasing lead time as the event nears. And um, so we can also objectively look at um, the object area um, in this plot here, looking at a time series with decreasing lead time. Um, and here the object area is increasing slightly um, with decreasing lead time. And then finally, looking at the revision series in the right plot, um, we look for consistency. So while in this plot, the revisions appear more random, um, the changes aren't extreme um, compared to actual objects size, um, but a better way to determine whether the revisions are consistent is to use the walled wall fluids run and autocorrelation statistic to test for randomness on the revisions. And I haven't yet run these tests, um, but they are available in that CalPy. And just to note that I created these plots uh, myself um, since they are not yet developed in, in the MetPlus yet. So finally, I'm going to briefly touch on difficulty index as we're still working on details for running this case. So I haven't, haven't run this case on a snowband yet. So the difficulty index um, provides a graphical way to represent the expected difficulty of a decision. And that's based on a set of forecasts, uh, such as an ensemble, and using a, a user-defined decision threshold. So the difficulty index is computed on the ensemble mean and standard deviation for a given decision threshold. And then this module, the module for computing the difficulty index exists in MetCalcPy. And then MetPlotPy can then be used to plot the difficulty index. And this is all done within a user contributed script. <laughs> so the example here is actually the example from the uh, MetPlus uh, like repository of use cases. Um, and it's looking at difficulty index of 10 meter, 10 meter wind speeds uh, using a decision th threshold of 36 knots, um, where the higher index value, um, the, the higher the index value, the more challenging the, the forecast will be. So for our purpose, we do plan to see what we can come up with using WPC's winter storm ensemble um, and possibly look at winter storm warning criteria or um, snowband related metrics such as the eight, uh, 850 millibar warm melt layer or uh, snow accumulations. And just to summarize briefly, so as part of the JTTI effort, um, a number of developments and enhancements have been made or they're currently in progress um, to refine a number of use cases with the goal of integrating them into the WPC routine um, model evaluations um, for streamlining evaluation and diagnostic investigations. And then for future work, um, we can, we'll continue to apply and refine the four use cases. And then we'll be extending the feature relative evaluation to include some diagnostic fields that are important to snowband evolution. Um, those are uh, such as uh, moisture convergence or um, low to mid-level warm air infection. And then extending the multivariate mode capability to mode time domain um, in year two. And then I'll be uh, working on contributing um, at least one of these use cases, such as the multivariate mode, to the MetPlus collection. And then we'll be integrating the MetPlus use cases into the WPC uh, model evaluation once they are fully mature. And with that, I will take any questions. Thanks, Tracy. Yeah, we do have time for at least one quick question. Chris, go ahead. Hi, Tracy. Um, really like the work uh, on into winter weather as well. And I uh, was curious about if this might be released as a paper. Um, that 
that hasn't really been discussed, but it's certainly something that we can uh, discuss at, at some point and, and maybe get a, a paper out. I, I, I'm not sure. It's not part of the, uh, you know, the deliverables for this project, but we'll see. Uh, the other question that maybe you, you discussed and I missed it, but what's the time time range you're looking at and the updates are they hourly or is this in the forecast consistency well you're using model or the mode time domain and right. i'm wondering if does that extend over a 24-hour period every hour or so for for the mode time domain we're, we're ingesting the um the hourly her uh, forecasts um, and we're running over a, a 48 hour period to identify objects um, in mo time domain is that answer your question yeah Thank okay you. sure sure Marian, do you have a quick question yeah just a quick comment i mean this difficulty index is is quite interesting if anybody can point me at more info about it i you know like to try and understand what <laughs> what it actually well ha, you know how it works out how difficult or not the forecast is um and the other one i think i i do like the idea of looking at the consistency i think using mo time domain for that sounds really interesting so definitely want to explore that great yeah those are those are two very interesting cases um yeah Thank you. Uh, just to, to follow up, um, I, I put this in chat, but Marian, um, the difficulty index was contributed by NRL. Um, so if you wanted to reach out to Liz Satterfield um, to just get some more details from them as to how they're using it, she did cover yeah. it a little bit in her presentation as well. But yeah, there's you know not a lot of, we, we don't have Yeah, a lot I was just of wondering if there's actually some documentation. I was going to follow it up with Liz at some point, yeah. but yeah. It's just it's come up again, so it's just yeah made me think of it again. Yeah. So the so the the goal of this project, this particular um, JTTI project, trying to transition technology into a, um, an operational center, was basically to just exercise some um, aspects of NetPlus that we haven't had an opportunity to do yet. And so um, I'm I'm envious of Tracy because Tracy gets leave to do all the fun work and and you know play around with all these different capabilities. Um, and Chris, yes, I, I think that um, you know what we were waiting to see is is what came out of these um, these explorations. But I, I do think that there's um, at least one, if not more, papers um, potentially um, possible from from this particular um, project. So we're we're pretty excited about it. Okay, great. Well, big round of applause to all the speakers. You know, actually. <laughs> They all did a great job. And I think we'll have a break now and come back to the plenary at 10.30. Tara, do you have any other announcements? Nope, you handled it well, thanks. Okay, thank you everyone. See you at the plenary. <laughs>